Thanks, Nina. Uh, well, good evening, everyone. Welcome along to our Christmas Eve service for 2023. As Jordan said, my name's Brendan McLaughlin, and I'm the uh, Senior Minister here at Erwood Anglican. And look, I don't know about you, but Christmas feels just a slightly different this year uh, with all the conflict going on around the world right now. But by conflict, I'm actually not talking about what's going on over in in Israel and Palestine, uh, I'm talking about how people are responding to it. Uh, I don't think there's been as many protests about a war since Vietnam. The legacy media and social media are, are still uh, go, blowing up every day and opinions are running hot, aren't they? I, uh, I heard one poll recently, it was an American poll, it said in America, uh, over 60% of Americans think that the current conflict is, is basically blamed, they blame it on Hamas. So 60% of Americans blame Hamas for the current conflict. But when you go to generate, uh, Generation Z, that shrinks to about 45%. And what that means is there might be some conflict over Christmas lunch tomorrow or all around the world uh, in, in some families. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, well, look, uh, I may not be able to avoid fighting with Uncle Bob at Christmas tomorrow, uh, Christmas lunch tomorrow, Brennan, but I, I come to church to get a break. Uh, I come to church to, uh, to sort of feel joy and peace and comfort. Why are you talking to me about all this conflict? Like, isn't, isn't Christmas supposed to be a time of, of joy and peace and comfort? And the answer is yes, it is. Uh, the main theme of the passage we just read is comfort. It's, it's consolation, all right? So we see two main characters. Uh, one of them is called Simeon, and we're told in verse 25 that he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And then we meet another character uh, by the name of Anna, and we're told that she, in verse 38, she was speaking about the redemption of Jerusalem. So Christmas is a time for peace and comfort. But... One of the aspects of Christmas that is rarely uh, sort of articulated is that Christmas is also a time for conflict, believe it or not. Uh, there is a combativeness about Christmas that many people don't realise. And we see that right in the middle of the passage. Uh, you can see it in verse 34 where Simeon says this to Mary. This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against. You see, what this passage tells us is that Jesus came into this world to divide people. Now, yes, he came to bring peace, but that peace comes through conflict. <clears throat> it's kind of like the Allied soldiers on D-Day, right? They, they stormed the beach at Normandy and then fought their way across, uh, halfway across Europe to end the war, to stop the Nazis. But the way they brought peace was through the sword. And it's very similar with Jesus, all right? The peace that Jesus came into the world to bring is accomplished through picking a fight, through conflict, and I've got three points to help us uh, see this this evening. So you've got a sermon outline on the inside of your new sheet there, all right? Uh, so we're going to begin by looking at these two strange figures that Mary and Joseph meet at the temple, both of whom are looking for the consolation of Israel. So first point is Jesus brings consolation. We're then going to see that this consolation comes through dividing people. And I've called that, titled that, Jesus Causes falling and rising. And then we're going to conclude by seeing how exactly uh, this consolation comes. And that is that by the fact that Jesus pierces our heart. Jesus pierces our heart. So if you came in tonight looking for conflict and looking for peace, uh, the good news is Jesus brings consolation. The bad news is that consolation comes through conflict. So let's dive in. <clears throat> and our passage is, uh, is one of Luke's birth narratives. So it's about when Mary and Joseph took baby Jesus to Jerusalem to be dedicated. Now, this was a, a typical Jewish ritual. It was commanded by God, as we see in verse 23. It's kind of similar to our modern day christenings. All right. So it's, it's kind of a big deal. And when they're at the temple, they're met by two people. Uh, one called Simeon, Simeon and one called Anna. Now, these two people have several things in common. Number one, they're, they're both Jewish, but that's not surprising given they're in Israel. Number two, they're both quite old, 
right? So Simeon, we're told, is ready to die in peace. And Anna, uh, we're told, was 84 years old. That's well belong the life expectancy of a first century person. Uh, third thing, we're told they're both righteous and devout, right? These are good people. These are good people. And fourthly, both Simeon and Anna had been told by the Holy Spirit about Jesus ahead of time. But this raises the question, why these two? Like uh, Luke takes his time to tell us a fair amount about these two people. We, we, we hear a lot about these two people and we actually never hear about them again in the whole Bible. They just zip in for a verse or two and zip out. But we get a lot of information. Uh, why is he, he going to all this trouble? It's because he wants us to ask, out of all the people in Israel, why choose these two people to reveal Jesus to uh, ahead of time? And the answer is these two actually have a fifth thing in common. And that fifth thing is they are both looking for the consolation, uh, the relief, the redemption of Israel. Uh, you see, in the centuries leading up to Jesus' coming, Israel had been, oppre been oppressed by like whoever was the main superpower of the day. So Israel had been conquered by uh, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, and now the Romans were in charge. Uh, yet God had promised in the Old Testament, and Jordan spoke about it at the beginning of the service, he promised that he would one day break into history once again, kind of like what he did in the Exodus, and he would, uh, he would redeem his people. And that's what both Simeon and Anna are looking forward to. They are looking forward to God redeeming his people and bringing peace. And so what God does is he tells these two people, Simeon and Anna, you need to go to the temple on this particular day, at this particular time of that day, and meet Mary and Joseph and tell them what their child is going to be like when he grows up. Now, I don't know about you, uh, but when I look at a little baby, it's kind of difficult to determine what they're going to be when they grow up. Uh, there's a few exceptions to this. So here's, here's one exception. Uh, what do you think that baby's going to be when he grows up? DJ, maybe a muso. What about this one? A bikey. Or my favourite. That's right, a high school teacher. Uh, when most of us look at babies, we have no idea what the future holds for them. Yet God chooses to reveal to these two devout uh, Israelites that Jesus, uh, what Jesus was going to be when he grew up. And he guides them to the temple just at the right moment uh, to reveal that to his parents. This child will bring about the consolation, right, the redemption of Israel that they've been waiting for. But here's the thing. <clears throat> That consolation comes at a cost, right? It's going to divide people. And according to verse 34, Jesus will cause some to rise and some to fall. He's going to be what journalists call a controversial figure. And the reason he's going to divide people is because he's going to make an outrageous claim. You see, when Jesus grew up, he claimed to be the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And here's the thing. There's just no way to stay neutral about a person like that, is there? Uh, in the Monty Python movie, The Holy Grail, King Arthur is asking a local peasant, you know, which, which lord lives in that castle? And the peasant looks at him funny. He's all dressed funny. Uh, this guy with a crown on his head. He said, who are you, and who are you then? And he says, I'm Arthur, king of the Britons. And the peasant goes, and who are the Britons? And he says, we all well, We're all Britons and I am your king. And the peasant says, well, I didn't vote for you. And then he goes off on this long rant, right, about how, uh, you know, we, supreme executive power, he says, arises from a mandate from the masses. What is he saying? He's saying it's all about democracy. And that's the thing. Like, we, we actually like democracy. We like, we don't mind having a government, but we like being able to vote them out every couple of years if they're not cutting the mustard, right? We want to have a say in who rules us. Yet along comes this Jesus with this outrageous claim. I am the king of kings. And alongside that, he starts to ask for outrageous things. He makes outrageous demands like love your enemy, like sell all your possessions, give to the poor. Like if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. 
And so it's not surprising that many people fell out with Jesus, even to the point of killing him, right? Do you know what is surprising about Jesus? What is surprising about Jesus is that anyone chose to follow him. Like, do you realize, I don't know if you, you, you knew this or not, but Jesus is the only uh, person in human history to claim to be God who actually went on to start a major world religion. Like, can you, can you think of any major world religion where the person who started it claimed to be God? Usually when people do that, it doesn't take long for those around them to realize actually this guy is a bit of a crackpot. Yet Jesus was able to gather enough followers around him to start the world's largest and still to this day fastest growing religion on in the world. Now, how did he do that? Well, the only answer is that when people saw his life, they realized he was every bit as moral and good and kind and beautiful as the Bible says he was. Right? Those who saw Jesus up close and personal for three years all gave their allegiance to him as the Son of God. Now, you might at that point say, well, hang on a minute, hang on a minute, Brennan. You're talking about falling and rising. What about those people who don't, who don't love Jesus, but they don't necessarily hate Jesus? All right, They're kind of in the middle. And I'll admit to you, there are some people in that category. There are some people in the middle. Uh, they don't neither fall nor rise when it comes to Jesus. But the only reason they do that is because they don't know the real Jesus. They prefer to think of Jesus as some sort of good moral teacher. The problem is there is zero historical evidence for such a person and such a claim. All right? Their Jesus is nothing more than a figment of their imagination. The reason being you cannot be a good moral teacher and claim to be the son of God. It doesn't work like that. All right? You are either a crackpot or a charlatan or you're telling the truth. Uh, friends, in the end, there is only two responses when it comes to Jesus. You either have to hate him or you have to make all your life decisions based on him. There is no middle ground when it comes to the historical Jesus. And so third and final question is, how can such a divisive figure possibly bring consolation? And the answer comes with the final thing that Simeon says to Mary. So he says this in verse 25. He says, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Now what's he talking about there? He's talking about the crucifixion where Mary will stand at the foot of the cross and have to watch her firstborn son die an agonizing death. And so what Luke 2.25 tells us is that Jesus was born in order to die. Now, that is an extraordinary thing to say about a little baby, isn't it? But that's what the New Testament teaches. Jesus came down to earth to open the door for us into heaven. Now, there are many people today that object to this notion. They don't like this idea that heaven, the door to heaven is shut to sinful humans. Right? There, was a, there was a conversation that happened many years ago with a, a very famous Baptist preacher by the name of Charles Spurgeon. He was chatting to a guy on the docks one day and he said to this man, do you have a good hope that when you die, God will accept you into heaven? And the man said, well, look, I, I, I certainly hope so. I, I, I'm as good as most folk are. And Spurgeon looked at him and said, oh, dear, dear gentleman, dear sir, I, uh, I, I do not have uh, a, a, a lot of hope for that. I'm very concerned for you. Is that, is that the best you can rely on? And he said to the man, don't you realize that you have sinned your whole life? What hope do you have that God will forgive you of that? And the man said, well, look, I've, 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 I'm sorry for my sins. And I've actually stopped a lot of them. And Spurgeon said to the man, look, can I ask you, suppose you get into debt with a shopkeeper. You run up a tab over a couple of weeks and in the end, you have to go in and say, look, I actually can't pay for those, those goods that I've already taken. But I'll tell you what, I promise that from now on, I won't get into debt ever again. 
And he said, do you think the shopkeeper will accept that answer? And the man said, I guess they wouldn't. And Spurgeon said, why then do you think you can treat the God of the universe that way? Uh, friends, every single one of us has sinned against God. We've all put ourselves into debt with God. And the reason baby Jesus was born into the world was to redeem us from that debt. And that's what he did in his death. All right, On the cross, Jesus took the sinner's place to pay the sinner's penalty. That's the good news. The bad news is that receiving this redemption only comes through a conflict in our own heart. Right? To be forgiven means the message of Jesus has to pierce our own heart in a similar way to the cross piercing Mary's heart. And it pierces our heart in two ways. All right? So firstly, it pierces it in repentance. Uh, the reason repentance feels like a sword to our heart is because repentance is not just admitting we've done bad things. Most people will put their hand up for that. We know we've done bad things. Real repentance is admitting that those bad things stem from a sinful heart. Right? Real repentance means admitting the reason that I cheat and that I lie and that I steal and that I gossip and that I lust is because I want those things more than I want God. The second way the message of Jesus pierces our heart is through faith, right? So it's repentance and faith. I don't know if you've heard of that before. And faith means obeying all of Jesus' commands. And the reason faith feels like a sword to the heart is because Jesus' commands don't always look like the path to comfort and joy. Right? Sometimes when we take the path of obedience, it leads to us losing our reputation. We may lose our job. We may lose our boyfriend or girlfriend. We may lose money. Right? Jesus says because we live in a fallen world, the path to obedience is often the path of conflict. But, says Jesus, because this world is still my world, the path of obedience will in the end bring peace. Right? So true consolation comes through repentance and faith. So as we close, I just want to ask two questions. First, have you allowed the sword of repentance to pierce your heart? Because if you haven't, then you still have to pay for your own sin. Now, which would you rather? Having to pay off your own sin in hell or having the comfort, enjoying the comfort, of knowing that Jesus has already dealt with all your sin on the cross. Uh, because here's the catch. You have to make that decision in this life. Once you die, your decision's already locked in. It's too late. Second question. Are you allowing the sword of obedience to pierce your heart? Now, this is the question for both Christians and non-Christians alike. You see, even Christians struggle with faith, with obedience. And the reason being, it means giving up control of our life. And that's really hard, being out of control, right? You know, uh, people are afraid of, afraid of flying. The reason they're afraid of flying is because you're out of control. Someone else is in the cockpit. <clears throat> we don't like being out of control. But here's the question. Who do you think is the better pilot? Right, there was a movie uh, a couple of years ago called Sully. You may have heard of it. It's a true story about Captain Ch Ch uh, what is it? Chesley Sully Sullenberger, who is the only airline pilot to ditch a passenger plane in water. Now imagine you were on that flight where three minutes after taking off from LaGuardia, your plane hits a flock of birds and both engines dead straight away, but you don't have enough altitude to make it to a, to a runway. Who do you want in that cockpit? You or Captain Sully? When it comes to your life, who is more qualified to be in your cockpit? You who have been around for 20, 40, 60, 80 years? Or the almighty, all-powerful, all-good and all-loving eternal creator of the universe? 
Now, to help you answer that, let me, uh, let me finish with a story of a man who was visiting the Louvre in Paris. And as this man was walking around, he was looking at the Rembrandts and the Monets and the Picassos and the Da Vinci's. And as he went from painting to painting, he very loudly was critiquing the paintings, criticizing him. He was saying, oh, look, what terrible brush strokes on this one. Oh, this one has no story. Look at the poor construction and movement in this one. There's no expression, no emotion near this one. And after a while, one of the, uh, one of the very annoyed curators of listening to this, uh, uh, you know, for you know, 20 minutes or so, he came over to the man and he said, Sir, it's not the paintings that are on trial today. It's the visitors. Now, friends, when you are confronted with the historical Jesus who was born in order to die for your sin, it's not actually Jesus who's on trial. It's the listener. So will you allow the message of Jesus to pierce your heart this Christmas and find real consolation?